Bem-vindos à segunda sessão das conversas sobre o futuro. Hoje vamos conversar sobre o futuro da igualdade com dois grandes especialistas nesse tema, autores de contribuições recentes, entre as mais marcantes, sobre a questão da igualdade e, sobretudo, sobre a evolução, infelizmente, da desigualdade no mundo, quer a nível global, quer entre países. São eles, Daniel Markovitz e Filipe Von Paris. Eu vou agora mudar para inglês para poder conversar com eles. Hello, Philippe. Hello, Daniel. I thought we could start maybe just very quickly for an overview of where we stand in terms not of equality, but unfortunately inequality. And there's a lot of controversy of the extent to which uh, inequality has been growing and where it has been growing and how it has been growing. But I think that, is, uh, that we can say at least three things, and if you disagree, then step in to correct me or to offer a different perspective. The first one is that uh, it depends, for example, if we look at inequality at the global level or the European level and in between countries or within countries. So in Europe, for example, um, inequality has increased with respect to some countries like Portugal, unfortunately, and Southern Europe. That is, there's, there's been stronger divergence uh, within Europe in some respects, but with other countries there we have seen convergence, like the Baltic countries, for example. So in general I think we can talk of more divergence than convergence in Europe, but still it's not an unequal and uniform picture. At the global level I think we see a little bit the same thing, because we've seen uh, inequality with certain regions of the world decreasing, China as a big factor. Uh, in that respect, because it has brought a lot of people out of poverty and therefore approximated the income uh, with other regions of the globe, but there are also other parts of the globe. Even if the country, and you say that, Philip, uh, often that uh, even if the, probably the most likely factor that determines whether someone is poor or rich or will be poor or rich is still the country where you live. But in addition to that, we have seen an increased level of inequality within countries, and particularly in Western countries. And I think that's one of the reasons why we also see a lot of social tensions. And there's been part of your work. And I will perhaps start with Philip uh, uh, and ask you, you say that the role of the philosopher is that, among others, of helping us understand that there are just and unjust forms of inequality. Uh, so, I would ask you, can you tell us what are just and unjust forms of inequality? And, and particularly, when we talk about wealth inequality, that is just one of the forms of inequality, is it always bad or is there circumstances where wealth inequality can be accepted, for example? Well, uh, my own view about that is that um, the problem with inequality is not as such that some people have more than others sometimes even much more than others. The problem is that uh, the fact that some people have so much more than others mean that some of the worst off, the people uh, who have less good prospects than others, could, be, uh, could have far, more, uh, far better prospects if there were less inequality. Uh, another way of putting it is that some inequalities can be justified but only on condition that they contribute to making the worse off better off than they would otherwise be. And why can that be? Well, um, you may say that some inequalities may enable the more productive people, the more innovative people to do some job that can then benefit everyone in society, or it may be simply because they need that in order to motivate them to invest in their own training, uh, to, uh, to take risks uh, and to work uh, very hard. And so on this position, and so it's not that inequality is bad as such, but inequality can only be justified if it contributes to making the worst of better off. But don't you think that at a certain level of relative difference of inequality is such that our sense of relative justice also plays a role. Let me say, for example, give the case, of Ireland is a good example because inequality has risen in Ireland, but most people are much better off. And perhaps there we don't see social tensions. But there may be instances where if, even if everybody is better off, if some are way, way much better off than others, 
that will affect the social uh, uh, fabric and, 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 and support, for example, for democracy. Yeah. It, it, well, I mean, the, I, first of all, so when these people are so much better off, surely it's most likely that if they were taxed a bit more or quite a bit more than they are now, it would be possible to improve the situation of people who are very bad off in that situation. But you might say that even some inequalities that contribute to making the worse off better off are nevertheless problematic. And you, you may need them in order to motivate these people to work as hard as uh, they do, but they may be bad, partly for reasons which uh, Daniel has uh, highlighted, because then they'll have so much money that through the education they'll provide, uh, the, the, the sort of exaggerated level of education they'll try to provide to their kids and be able to provide to their kids, that will harm uh, the other people in society in this indirect way. But some people say also that there is a certain degree of inequality that even if it is beneficial for the worst off is unacceptable because it, it jeopardizes a feeling of equal dignity in that society, a feeling of equal status. And uh, of course, we are so far from a situation that could be justified by the contribution to the situation of worst off that it's hard to assess this argument. And I think there it's also above all a question of attitude, of I, I, I think arrogance is a terrible thing for a society. But if you have inequalities, in where in inequalities which are framed in such a way and experienced in such a way that the people who have more than others realize how much they owe to luck in their life rather than to anything for which uh, they can deserve any sort of, uh, of praise, well, that creates and that, that may create, despite some inequalities, nevertheless, a form of uh, substantive equality of status between the members of that society. But I repeat, we are very far from that situation because much of the current inequality, both within countries and worldwide, cannot possibly be justified by that contribution to the improvement of uh, the, the situation of the worst off in terms of the opportunities, the possibilities, the real freedom they have to realize whatever they would like to do with their life and are prevented from doing through the inequalities that currently exist. Uh, Daniel, your book, your very famous and recent book, uh, is focused on meritocracy, but in fact it's an argument about inequality. And so, and I remember when we talked about it a few years ago when you started to working on it, that at, the moment, at that moment was mostly an idea that inequality had become so big in the United States that it, would start, it had eliminated also any chance of social mobility. Uh, uh, it basically had created a vicious cycle. And that's to a large extent what your uh, uh, argument is still about, but presented in a way that is somehow counterintuitive to people. I mean, when someone hears initially the idea that you say that meritocracy is a bad thing, we are all a bit puzzled, isn't it? Uh, so, can you explain better than that uh, what the argument is about? So let me say two things. The first is just to connect the thing I'm about to talk about to the exchange you just had with Philippe, because there's a third distinction that's really important to focus on when we talk about inequality, which is that even within a country, there are two kinds of inequality. There's the gap between the middle class and the poor, which is low-end inequality. And then there's the gap between the middle class and the rich, which is high-end inequality. And what we've seen throughout the rich nations of the world is that the low-end inequality has been shrinking. The middle class and the poor are converging, even as the rich are leaving the middle class behind. And that's incredibly important for this question, when is inequality in itself damaging? because what we're seeing is a middle class that for 50 years from the end of the Second World War to the mid-1990s dominated the culture, was the source and of, of economic energy, of cultural force, of growth, is now being shut down. You said to me earlier that in Portugal, the minimum wage is approaching the median wage. <laughs> because the middle class wages are just or, stagnant. Or the medium wage is approaching, approaching the minimum, minimum wage. wage. Exactly, both directions, right? Because middle class wages are stagnant. And no amount of redistribution, taxes and spending, will make the middle class regain its sense of self-confidence. Because what the middle class wants 
isn't that the government takes care of itself. It wants a society and a system in which it can stand on its own feet. And that now connects back to the question you asked about meritocracy. How can it be that a system in which people advance based on their own accomplishments could be so destructive? And the short answer is that none of our accomplishments is just our own. All of our accomplishments depends on what we've been taught how to do. And when you have concentrated wealth and privilege at the top, rich parents spend amounts of money on training their children that nobody can match, not the middle class, not the poor. And rich children then become more and more and more accomplished. And that's what leaves the middle class stagnant and excluded. And it's precisely the mechanism that everybody's judged based on their accomplishment that makes it possible for the middle class to be excluded in this way. Because the rich kids, in fact, have accomplished more. Because more has been invested in them. And to give you a sense of the scale of this, in a typical US American school, a middle class child gets about $12,000 a year spent on its education. In an elite private school, where almost all the children are rich, a typical child gets $75,000 a year spent on its education. And that makes it unsurprising that when it comes time to take tests or get jobs, the kids who went to the fancy private school do better. They're the meritocrats. They have more merit. And the middle class kids are excluded. And then, and here's the kicker, this economic exclusion is then coupled with a moral insult in which the system says to the middle class kids, you're not good enough. If you had been more talented or harder working, you could have that job. But you can't have it, not because it's unfair to you, but because you didn't measure up. And so you have economic exclusion characterized as justified. And that is a particularly venomous and damaging form of inequality. And that's what we're building now. But um, is that really a question of merit? Or some people say that you are not really criticizing meritocracy. And you yourself in your book recognizes the, the, the moral value even of the argument for merit. Uh, we could say that what you're saying is that what we call meritocracy as no longer, is no longer meritocracy, is in fact a form of corruption that while in other systems is proximity to power, for example, in this case it's financial corruption, that gives an undue advantage to some that therefore succeed and seem to have more talent than others when in fact is not really a product of their effort but of the fact that they've been educated through much more uh, wealthy means than others. I think a lot of that is right, but I think it, it, the effort to make, to, to, to rehabilitate merit underestimates how difficult the problem is. Because you're quite right that the rich kids who succeed don't have more talent and they don't have more effort. So they're not more virtuous, but they may actually be more skilled. And the reason why they're more skilled is that how skilled you are is a combination of three things, not two. It's talent and effort, and how much is invested in you. Mm -hmm. And when more is invested in some kids than others, those kids will do really well. And it's not equal, it's not opportunity, it's not fair, but it also is merit. It is merit. They actually are good at the thing that they're being told they're good at. And that's the thing that makes it so destructive. Mm -hmm. Because the person who's excluded can't say, you know, if I'm excluded from a job because of my race, I can say, well, that's just you know, both evil and insane. If you get a job because you're white. It's, and, it's and harder to correct than even other forms of corruption. It's harder to correct because we can't say, you, you have nothing going for you. You do, you're actually good at this thing. You, you should actually be the one doing this because you are better. But right. the problem is that you are better because, because you of started all these other... with a huge advantage yeah. with respect. Exactly. With and respect that's what makes it so destructive. The, to, to, to the others. We'll, we'll talk yeah. later about how, how, how to correct that. But I just wanted to also, um, you, when, you, when you talk about this, you also make and introduce some caveats with respect to Europe. Yeah. And uh, I think there are some differences in Europe, one of which is the importance that public education has in Europe and the easier access to education in Europe than the United States. I think the system in Europe is becoming increasingly segregated too, and those uh, with more money get better education and therefore an advantage too, but we still are not at the level of the United States. The second aspect is that what you see in the United States as aggravating this problem is the fact that in the US, uh, the premium people get 
for being highly qualified is much bigger right. than in Europe. So it's not only the fact that you get a much more favorable advantage starting point at, at, at the start uh, by having much better education, is then that you get a reward for that, mm -hmm. that it's much higher than in right. Europe because the salary difference for those with very high qualifications in the United States mm -hmm. is so big. This is not necessarily the case, right. for example, in Portugal, right. where in fact, we have a recent study done here for the Gobenkian Foundation that demonstrates that in the past few decades in Portugal, the premium, the salary yeah. premium that you get for your qualifications has been coming right. down, not up country to the United States. So how would you adapt your thesis to the European context and to other contexts? Great. I, I, first of all, I think there are several Europes. Um, you know, Absolutely. England, which I, I don't know if it's Europe anymore, but England mm -hmm. looks like the United States remarkably. Um, Germany and France are beginning to move in the U.S. American direction. If you look at, for example, wage premia in finance in France, they've been going way up. If you look at wage premia in management in Germany, they've been going up. And then there are other parts of Europe, including Portugal, where it just doesn't look like this phenomenon has been happening. And I guess I think there are maybe two lessons here. Um, one is one that's more critical of Portugal, and one is one that's more critical of the U.S. Uh, the, the lesson that's more critical of Portugal is my sense is that one of the reasons why the premia have not been going up in Portugal is that this is still a society in which wealth is significantly aristocratic, not in the sense that it's associated with titles, but it's associated with inherited economic position as owners and connections to networks. And so that's it's the gonna, capital versus label still. Yeah, and that's going to be a world in which being the super skilled outsider is not going to help you as much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of meritocratic inequality, but I'm also not a big fan of hereditary <laughs> aristocratic capital You are not inequality. against merit either. Yeah, exactly. And so that's a sense in which there's some criticism of a regime like Portugal's, in my view. Um, the criticism of the U.S. is that seeing the Portuguese example makes, makes you kind of think the U.S. is in a funny way not that different because replace physical capital with human capital. That is to say with investment in the talent and training of workers. And what you see in the US is a system in which a narrow class of elites is starting to monopolize human capital and starting to exclude others through mechanisms like university admissions where only rich kids get in. I'm exaggerating slightly, but Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford have more kids from top 1% families than from the bottom 60%. So I'm not exaggerating a lot. And those families then control jobs and work and the political system to make sure that regulations are not enacted that stop big banks from controlling finance in a certain way. And so what you have, in fact, is a kind of extractive industry just like Portugal has a kind of extractive economy, it's just the thing that's extracted is old wealth networks. And in the US you have a kind of extractive economy and the thing that's extracted from is this meritocratic crazy training. Mm -hmm. And so in the end the US is not actually that different, it's just it's a different resource. Well, the cause of the, uh, of the lack of mobility right. uh, is different, but basically it reaches a similar But the similar pattern outcome. is the same, yeah. exactly. The, the self-reinforcing pattern, exactly. basically, is, is exactly. the same. Philip, you've proposed a now very famous possible solution or part of a solution to the problems of inequality that made of you almost a pop figure, <laughs> <laughs> if I can say so. That is the, the universal basic income. This idea that anyone should get a basic income, uh, independently of any conditions, of, uh, independently of the relative wealth of, of people. Uh, th this sounds very, again, very counterintuitive for anyone. The idea that we should give the same amount of money to, to anyone and to, a and to everybody and without any, con any, any conditions. Can you perhaps explain a little bit better this idea that perhaps we could identify with the dire straits music, offering people money for nothing, checks for free? Can you justify that? Yeah, and also by connecting it to the earlier discussion, because the, the background 
picture is really that uh, we have these huge inequalities uh, within our societies. And in fact, when you think about it more than uh, half a minute, you realize that how much of this wealth that can be uh, earned, and so also in terms of income, not only accumulated, but how much of this income that can be earned by some people is not in any sense of desert, of merit, owed to uh, them, but it's due to a, an incredible succession of technological uh, progress in the past, capital accumulation, the organization of our societies, including the legal system, the, the, the road code, all the things that, uh, that function in our societies. And just think about, compare the real income of those people to people who would do jobs that would be somewhat similar uh, 100 years ago or in different society, expending just uh, as much effort as them. So you realize how much is due and to lucky circumstances, uh, where they were born, what languages they, they spoke, what talents they happened to have in terms of how much of a fit there was between what qualities they happened to have and the demand at a certain time, in, uh, at, at a certain point in time. And so what the basic income does is in fact sh consists in sharing more equally this, these rents that are employment rents uh, to a large extent that are very unequally appropriated by people because of, the, of different personal features or, or features of the society in which were, they were born. And there will always be a mix of uh, the talents they had at birth, their position in the family, uh, the networks that uh, they had access to because of their parents and so on. And so what the basic income does is all these things which are in a sense inherited from our surroundings, from the past, we are going to distribute them equally. Uh, between equally, but I mean, it's only part of it, part of these gifts that are distributed in the form of the basic income. Of course, those who make efforts, those who have special talents will always appropriate more over and above. They'll receive their basic income, but they'll have more. And so, uh, of course, it means getting something for nothing, but of course, the people who now appropriate these rents as part of their income get a huge amount on, in just because of, of, of an effort that may be considerable, but without proportion with, uh, uh, with what they get. The, the argument for the universal basic income is, is an argument that is a moral argument, and you've basically exposed that moral argument now. But there's also uh, an efficiency argument that is yeah. sometimes uh, raised, and you've raised it yourself. It's the idea that by not making it conditional, on, for example, whether the persons have a certain level of income or not, or have a work or don't have a work, you eliminate a series of perverse incentives not to work that current uh, uh, welfare benefits include. Because often what happens today is that when people start to work, they lose a lot of the welfare benefits, and therefore, rationally, it may make very little sense for them to actually. Uh, um, uh, but the problem with that uh, is also how much that will cost, because that requires precisely the universal dimension, giving it to anyone independently of what you are earning. And, and the question is, that, that has proved is, itself, the, perhaps the strongest criticism of the program is that it will be unbearable, too, too difficult. I mean, in, in Finland, for example, they've made uh, some calculus, though they've made an experiment on, on, on it, that actually challenged the idea that, that it could promote more uh, employability, that people will actually behave differently. Uh, and I would like your comment on that, on the Finnish experiment. But they also said that if they will generalize it uh, fully, it will probably mean that the higher tax rate will have to go up uh, until 70%. How do you answer those criticisms? Okay, first of all, I... I, I, I Long uh, my decennia now of uh, defending that idea in uh, all six uh, continents and in various languages, 
I've discovered that the, the strongest objection and the most emotional objection to the ID is not the question of financeability or administration, uh, but it is really the moral objection uh, that considers saying, how can you have Give an access to Give the same to, to everybody. Income? Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the real what makes also this an interesting proposal because you get criticized both on the right and on the left, yes, basically, absolutely. on the political spectrum. Yes, whether, and so, and that's also, is very divisive. Uh, both uh, left-wing parties and right-wing parties are very divided on, yeah. on that issue. When, uh, but, uh, so, to uh, turn then to, uh, to uh, you, your question, so, the, um, there are, um, uh, indeed, basic income also has these advantages you, you described, so it's, uh, and so it's, uh, uh, it's supposed to replace at least partly the safety net we have now in the form of social assistance. Uh, and social assistance is an important progress. It was recently now in Spain, uh, uh, you had the, the, the ingreso minimo vital that was introduced uh, for the first time a general uh, social assistance program. You, you had the reddito cittadinanza in Italy, all this, but all these are conditional and indeed have the perverse effects uh, which, you, uh, which you mentioned, that is, there is the, the unemployment trap because you can't combine that income with a small income uh, from an internship or whatever, or part-time job which, uh, we, which you can get, so people get trapped in that. It's also more stigmatizing than the universal income would be. Uh, the rate of take-up is uh, usually many people entitled to it, never get it or, or get it uh, too late. And also, and that was indeed highlighted by the uh, Finnish experiment, there's a, another dimension in it, and, and I'll uh, so mention that, in, but first uh, say something about the, the Finnish experiments. What, what did it consist in? Well, uh, there were, there are in Finland about 150,000 people who get the basic social assistance, 560 euros per person. And uh, what happened for two years, so 2017, 2018, 2,000 of these people received the same amount, but unconditionally. That meant that if they went and lived with someone with an income, they kept it. If they got a job uh, that was paying they them They would lose some that money, amount. They would continue to earn it, even if they, they would get a job. They continue to earn. And also, uh, they no longer had to show they were looking for a job. And the, the, the officers of the, the employment office didn't come to them and say, here is a job for you. So, no obligation. And so, what uh, did one find out in terms of participation in the labor market? First year, no significant effect. Second year, a significant effect, not huge, but uh, statistically significant and certainly causal because you had an experimental group and a control group, and it was a very clean experiment. So the people in the experimental group, so who got this same amount but unconditionally, worked on average six more days than the people in the control group. But in addition to that, what um, uh, the other significant uh, impact uh, which the, uh, the, the, this uh, measure had, and the unconditionally had, was that the, the subjective feeling of uh, health and the, their own assessments of their health was significantly better. The amount so of their self-esteem uh, was... Their self-esteem was greater. Also their, their uh, optimism about their own future and the level of stress they had uh, experienced. And so, therefore, you also have these sort of effects in terms of the efficiency that, that for these people who are the people, I mean, the worst off in the society, it's independently of the amount, it's the unconditionality that has also in this sense an efficiency uh, effect. Now, can it be scaled, uh, scaled up? So can... How can much it, would it cost, basically? It That's a big issue. And how much it will it mean then in terms of tax rates for everybody else? So if, if you, if we are talking about this sort of amount, uh, it's very important to see that if you scale it, if you introduce it for the whole of the population, you must largely finance it. The bulk of it can be financed out of two sources, which can be regarded as sort of self-financing. First source is that all the existing social benefits that are lower are, are scrapped. All those that are higher are reduced by the amount of the basic income, which means that you have an unconditional uh, element in your, say, unemployment benefit, and 
you have the basic income. You have income. those savings that you can then use for the, for the basic income. Exactly. And so you, you, re, you keep top-ups, even in some cases social assistance top up for the people who are handicapped and so on. But of course social insurance top-ups, including in the form of earnings-related uh, pensions and so on. But the second important source is that in all our uh, personal income tax systems, we have an exemption for the lower layers of everyone's income and a low rate, usually uh, 20%, 25% uh, for the next uh, layer, the next tranche of, of income. All this would be scrapped, uh, so you would be taxed at 30% or 35%, whatever, it will depend from one country to another, from the first euro you earn. And of course, the people who have low incomes or who are part-timers will have a higher income because all this will be compensated by their basic income. Will there be a net cost? Yes, there will be a net cost. And, uh, but, which but there's divergence on how much that will be. That's where the discussion is often Yes, focused. because usually, I mean, not you, most people now do the right sort of calculations and there are simulations for, uh, in, in, in many countries. And, but of course, the net cost would be a fraction of the growth cost if we are talking about this sort of amount. And so uh, for and, or 400 euros or 500 euros, and then there is a, a net cost, but of course this net cost will either can take the form of indirect uh, taxation, but it can also take the form of, uh, of, of a reduction in inequality by taxing more, not only the super rich, but also the moderately rich, like you and me. Uh, that is, uh, uh, people who are well off, uh, but uh, uh, who are not among the super rich, but whose income will need to be taxed in order to reduce the overall level in, of inequality and to enable more people uh, to, uh, uh, to have this sort of uh, minimum real freedom. In a way, and that's, I finish with that and because it's for me the, the most important aspect of the efficiency of introducing this sort of system, which is that basic income is a, a, an essential complement for lifelong learning and because uh, having this basic income means that you can have a far more flexible back and forth between employment, education and then voluntary activities within your household or more broadly throughout life. So we need to revolutionize our, our education at the same time so to put more, much more emphasis on this lifelong learning so that people will work longer than the, a a then, lot of this efficiency argument resides on the expectation that of the simplification of the system, that therefore that we scrap all other welfare benefits. Knowing a little bit how politics works, uh, to what extent can we expect that politicians for the future will not be pressured into introducing uh, new welfare benefits and therefore that, that simplification element and that the additional costs. I mean, we've, we've seen that with simplifications of tax code systems. We eliminate tax benefits, we reduce tax rates, and, and we say this simplifies what we save by eliminating tax benefits uh, we can use to lower tax rates. And then what happens is then slowly new tax benefits and the Christmas tree effect yeah. <laughs> starts happening again. Won't that be the case in this, the, this well, case too? There, there, there is a risk, but at the same time one must not exaggerate the degree of simplification that will be introduced because it will be a sort of floor on, for everyone, but then there will be top-ups that will remain conditional and so there will, the, there will be some balls and little presents from the Christmas tree that will be visible but, as top-ups. But they can't be met or otherwise they start creating incentives not to work sure, again. Sure, but, okay. but what will happen is that under the unemployment trap in that case wouldn't be abolished, but it would be significantly reduced, especially when you have, uh, when you have households with more than uh, one person. D Daniel, your work has also shares something in common with that of, of Philip, is that you both subject to criticisms on the left and the right, because your focus is on the middle class. Uh, uh, you, even before, you already told us that you believe that the real challenge today is the impoverishment of the middle class and the fact that the middle class can no longer uh, have social, mo so, social, social mobility. What well, it is indeed a problem when we see it I I in Europe too. But that has led you, and you make it as a, explicitly as a progress progressive leftist in the context of the United States argument. But on the other hand, that leads you to also criticize 
what you see as the current progressive agenda, uh, particularly its focus on identity politics, on uh, diversity and minorities, because you say it underestimates the extent of the inequality that exists in the United States that is not only linked to my minorities, um, and, uh, and, and it underestimates the problems of the middle class. How have the progressives reacted mm -hmm. to this criticism that you make, and to which extent have, have you been able to reshape the progressive agenda in the United States? Well, so I'm pretty far left on both identity politics questions and class questions. Um, I don't think in a fundamental way we, we have to choose between them. Um, I do think, though, a couple things that there is a tension at this particular moment. Uh, and some of this goes actually a little bit, Philippe, to your universal basic income question. So that the, the challenge for the progressive side of the political debate is how to build in a meaningful and complete and inclusive provision for a decent, dignified, secure, and free life for everyone in society without enraging nativist backlash. And you know, one of the problems with universal basic income is that as soon as we give universal basic income, the next question is, well, who gets it? Mm -hmm. And the answer that a certain portion of the population is gonna say is, well, not foreigners, not immigrants, not people of color. Mm -hmm. And so we need a politics that can explain how these universal provisions are in fact properly universal and can break the antagonism between the incumbent, largely white in the US and in Europe, largely Christian in the US and in Europe, middle class, and a, a whole host of others who have powerful claims. Uh, and against that backdrop, one of the problems that meritocracy creates is that because the meritocratic elite refuses to see all the advantages that it has, but is slightly worried that maybe its advantages are unjustified, it has a strong incentive to turn to identity politics as a way of vindicating its own fairness. So the elite says, we don't discriminate based on race. We don't discriminate based on religion. We don't discriminate based on ethnic or national origin. And that shows that we deserve all the advantages that we have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my law school, for example, now. So merit is used is, as a pretext is to continue other forms of my, discrimination. My, my law school is over half students of color. And that's a very good thing because the United States is, in young people, half people of color. And, and it should be thus. But my law school has a very small share of working class students. Mm -hmm. And insofar as progressive politics uses its embrace of diversity and inclusion as a way of refusing to face up to class questions, that's extremely damaging. It's, it's both wrong and politically unwise. And so the, the, main, the main point that, that I wanna make in all my work on these areas is that if you believe in equality and if you believe in inclusion and the dignity of every person, you have to find a way to generate a series of arguments that can deliver the economic side of that and at the same time deliver the identity politics side of that. And you have to find identity politics arguments that don't undermine the economic ones. And that's the tension that, that we're all playing with to try to come up with a theory that can do both those things at once, both in principle and in political practice. You propose two paths to get out of the meritocracy path. Um, and one of them is education and basically making education more accessible right. to all. Uh, and the other one is focused instead uh, on the labor, on the labor right. market, or mid-skill right. labor, better right. uh, rewarded with better salaries and more relevant again. Uh, what 
maybe coincide with the, U the agenda that we've called in Europe the reindustrialization of Europe, right. in part. Do you, can you develop a little bit what, what, what will be some concrete examples of steps that could be taken, perhaps in the United States, but yeah. some of them might be useful for Europe too, yeah. in both right. aspects? Right. Right, great. So let me say something about each of them and then say something about how they feed into each other because the economic and political dynamics of this are incredibly important too. But if we start with education, um, if we're going to live in a world in which people's advantage, their social status and their economic incomes are closely connected to how productive they can be in the labor market, we also need an education system that gives everybody the skills that they need to be productive in the labor market. And one thing that means is we can't have an education system in which a narrow elite monopolizes those skills. And so right now in the US, when we have schools where rich kids get $75,000 a year spent on their education and middle-class kids get $12,000 a year spent, that's simply unacceptable from any moral or political or economic calculus. And so the first step is massively to increase equality in education. And one way to do that that's very practical and politically feasible is to stop private schools from being treated as charities unless they educate lots of middle class kids. In the US today, private schools from preschool and kindergarten through Princeton University are all taxed as charities, which means that they're tax exempt and it means that donations by alumni are deductible as charitable contributions. And that amounts to a huge public subsidy for the very rich children who go to those schools. Princeton's public subsidy. So you would allow, me, allow them to continue to provide education to rich kids, to provide but, very good, but, but only, you say you need to also then offer education to poorer kids. To many, many more kids. So, and the way you do this practically is you enormously increase enrollments. Privates, there are lots of private schools in America which have only eight kids for every teacher. That's gold-plated, crazy education. You could easily have 16 kids for every teacher and have the eight new kids be middle-class and working-class kids. And what that would do is it would massively increase the supply of mid-skilled workers, massively dilute the returns to extravagant education, and rebalance education, and by the way, and make those the schools politically valuable and attractive again. And actually free resources that can be used, used for public, other free public resources to have for better other public kids. schools. Exactly. Example. So that's the first the thing. Time. The second thing to do is really to intervene in labor markets. And, and in a way, I think, Philippe, your universal basic income is a way of short circuiting the two mechanisms that I'm talking about, which is to say, you know, if you have really meaningful universal human skills formation and labor market reforms, that make it possible for every worker to make a reasonable income, you start approximating something that looks like a universal basic income. It's just, it's not conditioned in, or unconditioned in the same way, but you have a mechanism that distributes something similar. And a way to do that, you talk about the reindustrialization of Europe. Some of this is reindustrialization. There are lots of industrial goods that That hasn't been very successful in well, Europe. Well, you know, it's complicated. So um, in the US, um, industri so manufacturing share of GDP in the US is as high as it's ever been. It's just it uses fewer workers, okay? And there are moves in the US to start re-employing US Americans in manufacturing production by changing production techniques and changing production processes. And the jury is out about how successful or unsuccessful that may be. But there are also a whole series of other middle class jobs that could be created and emphasized that don't require a 20th century industrial model. Let me give you some examples. In medicine, we have far too few public health workers. We've seen this in the pandemic. Far too few nurse practitioners, nutritionists, exercise therapists. These are all mid-skilled jobs. If we had an army of people so that every citizen had regular contact with somebody whose job it was to teach them and support them in living a healthy lifestyle. This would enormously increase the effectiveness of our healthcare system. And it would pay for itself quickly, but most importantly, all of those jobs would be middle-class jobs. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have none of those people. Instead, we have specialist doctors 
and we wait till people get sick and then we send them to somebody in the US who makes $500,000 a year as a cardiologist to fix your heart. But if we had a nurse practitioner and nutritionist who gave you better diet and exercise, your heart wouldn't get sick in the first place, right? And so that's another part. And I could talk about teaching and care work and, 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 and law and finance. In all these fields, we could do the same thing and rebuild the middle class. I want way. to introduce a new point and, and yeah. to address it at Philip first, and then I also want your comment on that. Because somehow you raised it before when you said one of the problems when we discuss basic income or other measures to promote equalities, who deserves the equal treatment? And often we talk about equality uh, only in the context of our countries, of our states. But in fact, if the argument for equality is a moral argument linked to the equal dignity of each human being, the question emerges, what allows us to distinguish? Why shouldn't we have welfare measures that are open and universal even at, uh, uh, at the level beyond, beyond, beyond the state. W what allows us as human beings, as citizens, uh, to narrow our appreciation of equality, our policies regarding equality to our own states? If it's a moral obligation, as a philosopher, Philip, uh, shouldn't we owe it to everybody in the world? Yes. <laughs> so that is, if you ask uh, what allows us uh, morally to make this restriction, I say nothing. But uh, of course, what allows us pragmatically to make a restriction uh, to our own citizens. But uh, it's only yes. pragmatic. St. Thomas of Aquinas said the sentence that I always remember. He said, he said, if everyone is my friend, then I have no friends. So yeah. to a certain extent, can't we owe a sense of solidarity bigger, stronger to a narrow group of people than to all other human beings? I'm not saying yes. that, I'm just challenging yes. you on that, whether but you think. Thomas Aquinas also said, talked about the universal destination of all goods and said, if you can't satisfy your needs and the rich don't give it what you need voluntarily, then you can steal it. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, Aquinas or not, and so I, uh, I'll always uh, remember this uh, thing that happened to me when I was visiting Nigeria and uh, I was uh, on the point of uh, leaving uh, Nigeria and I was surrounded by kids uh, around me who spoke very good uh, English so we could communicate and one of the kids said, I want to go with you. And I said, uh, no, 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 your mom will never want you to, uh, you know, will never accept that, won't let you go. And then she said, yes, my mom would like you, me to go to Belgium because in Nigeria, they believe that Belgium is a German city from which many second-hand cars are coming, uh, good quality second-hand cars are coming into Nigeria. And uh, so my mom would like to go. And then I mumbled something that I felt was really a, a dishonest answer to a real <laughs> question. And uh, because in my view, related to what I said at the very beginning, there are two sorts of justification for whatever inequalities there may be. One is uh, when people are given the same possibilities and some um, make a better use of it. And of course, uh, their ability to make a use of the possibilities may be itself uh, uh, due to unequal possibilities linked to their, their family upbringing. And so you need to control for that. But essentially, if you have the same possibilities, and some get a, a higher income, more power, uh, because that's their choice and they can do it, that's fine. And the second reason is what I mentioned before, that is if, um, if, if the inequalities benefit to the worst off. But in this case, I couldn't say this little kid, look, we have the same possibilities, I just made, I'm, I'm, I'm can be as rich as I am. Then why don't we behave like that? Why do we feel that we have a sense of solidarity to those within our state, but not to yeah, others. Well, I, I think, so morally speaking, and so what I'm saying, contrary to some of my colleagues philosophers, it's not a good answer to tell the little chap, you are Nigerian, I'm Belgian, and that's the end of the story. I think fundamentally social justice question. is global justice. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that means that whatever we try to do in order to reduce uh, injustice in our respective countries, uh, well, raise the question, is this really what we should concentrate on when there are, and the, the American middle classes uh, suffer from uh, 
uh, from injustice with respect to the top earners. But my God, they are so rich compared to so many people next door to us here in Portugal, in, in Africa, people who are constantly growing in numbers. So what, what, what should we do? And, and I believe that's also what I wrote in my Gold Bank and ID. I believe there is a, a constant tension. There is a tension for me as a philosopher, but also a, as an activist who is trying to do something about uh, unjust, unjust inequalities. And therefore, what, what I, I think the, the, the proper answer is to say, well, we can't jump, jump when we can hardly walk. And so, but whenever we propose something that may improve, that should improve uh, the situation for some of the worst off in our society, reduce unjust inequalities, we must at the same time think, well, how can that also be relevant to people who are far worse off than we are in Europe. That can be by making experiments from which lessons can be drawn, for example, including our public spaces, how can we live in our cities uh, without cars, uh, etc. And that can be emulated as, elsewhere, etc. So I think we need to bear that in mind, but it doesn't leave the tension. The tension will always be there. We have to end with uh, that t tension. And, and I think it's very appropriate that we end this topic with such a hard question and with such tension, but also with the claim that you, that you made that we need to think of equality, not only within the context of our country, but always looking beyond. Thank you very much. Obrigado por nos terem seguido em mais esta conversa sobre o futuro. Uh, espero que possam assistir também à próxima conversa sobre o futuro. Thank you.